Welcome to Mediterranean Forum. Today, we talk about climate change and how the global transition will change our life in the next years. We are very proud to have as guests two very important people. First of all, I would like to introduce you, Ms. Corinne Kasia, Deputy Director, Global Affairs at Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs of Malta. So welcome, Corinne. Thank you. I'm very happy to have you here, finally, because <laughs> yes. we have a long story in, uh, <laughs> in inviting you and to have you in our forum. Yes, so, yes, I'm also very happy to, to be here. Thank you. I know that you are very busy, so thanks a lot, really. I appreciate uh, uh, your, your time. So um, I was reading uh, a, a report from Deloitte about uh, work toward net zero, where they analyze uh, the, the new rules and the new uh, perspective uh, according to climate change and the global transition. How Malta is react of the new economy and the new uh, scenario that we have? Well, I think, um, like most other um, countries um, in the world, um, Malta is also um, transitioning uh, to, to the net zero future. So in that sense, I think um, we are all aware that there is a, a global drive to, to ensure that um, climate change um, is, is, mitiga is mitigated. And um, the... Uh, the ways that climate change is being mitigated is through, of course, um, the transition uh, from, for example, uh, oil, gas, coal industries to to more uh, cleaner um, energy energy sectors. And um, in this uh, in this sense, I wish to um, point out also that. Very often we think of climate change as um, as uh, as a negative, as, as bad for the planet. But um, in other senses, it's also um, an opportunity. So from this uh, challenge that we are facing of climate change, of sea level rise, um, of uh, deforestation, of, um, uh, for example, biodiversity loss, um, plastic pollution, etc. From all these negative, let's say, challenges, there are also opportunities. And um, this opportunities is resulting from the fact that um, the push to put a break on the climate change and to cut emissions, um, which is bad news because um, these sectors these so-called unclean sectors actually employ many, many people. So the ILO, for example, has confirmed that uh, the fossil fuel sectors of oil, gas and coal employ more than 18 million, glo million people globally. So that is, of course, uh, an economic driving force that needs to be taken into account. Um, once you move from the... Um, let's say, unclean sectors to the clean sectors, then, of course, you're going to have that, um, let's say, economic loss or job losses. But there's also an opportunity. And um, the fact is that moving towards a cleaner transition would also um, um, estimate that it will create 24 million additional jobs as the ILO um, recently reported um, in its statistics, and this will be a net increase of 18 million uh, people. So um, let's say 18 million people in new jobs. So that's a very, very positive. So you can say that uh, transitioning to a net zero future will uh, make uh, losses of, uh, let's say, 6 million jobs worldwide by 2030. But on the other hand, uh, greening of the global economy will create 24 million additional jobs. So what we're seeing is that the transition will create new industries, new jobs, revitalize local economies. And um, it's creating new growth opportunities for businesses as well, which leads to new jobs being created. Uh, but um, in this sense as well, although the, there is a positive to, to, to this side, um, you'd have to ensure that um, you are also creating the context for these new jobs uh, to, be, uh, to be created. So 
my point, what I'm trying to say is that the transition from a, an unclean to a clean environment um, will create new jobs. But are governments and businesses ready to ensure that there is um, the skills needed for these new jobs, that they know exactly um, what um, these jobs um, will um, um, ensure in the longer term uh, a, a, the stability of the economy. So Malta, like other countries, is also doing um, this transition and it's also encountering these challenges. So, for example, in the public sector where I work, we have had additional jobs created in, in the ministries, in the departments, um, jobs that did not exist before. So you have um, different um, uh, positions, for example, director for sustainable development, director for climate change, uh, director for program implementation. So these did not exist before. They are new. And, um, and you, have, you have this challenge. You're creating new jobs which is very, very positive. But on the other hand, you're also creating a burden on the public service and you need to ensure that you have the right people for these jobs and you have to have the right skills. So in that context, I think there is a, um, uh, an excitement about the fact that the, the transition is creating new businesses, but there's also the um, issue that um, governments um, have to be also very, very well prepared and resilient to ensure that these jobs um, are, um, are, uh, are sufficient enough to, uh, to also uh, ensure uh, economic stability and, um, and uh, also um, ensure that um, they, uh, they, they are a uh, future that uh, there are jobs that can continue for the long term, so to speak. Um, according to what you say, uh, I have a question. So you have a program for reskilling the people or you are thinking to employ people with uh, the new, uh, let's say, uh, graduation, new, new skill on, uh, on the staff, on the public staff. So uh, which is your approach? You are uh, thinking to program to reskilling um, well, the thing is that these jobs um, have already been created and, um, and uh, previously they did not exist. So they are new uh, approaches to, uh, to creating um, more, let's say, opportunities in the public sector. But bearing in mind that this, there is a context behind these new jobs being created. And the context is that the transition from a, let's say, unclean to a clean energy has created um, more um, policy implementation, for example. And so what we are doing is we are trying to ensure that the right people um, are employed in these positions. And for this, you need to, to, um, to, um, to ensure that they have the right skills. And that means that for example, let's say at University of Malta, we have um, uh, also uh, uh, academic courses. Let's say I was um, present for, for one for the opening um, a few weeks ago, the International Ocean Institute regional course, which governs, for example, ocean governance. So we are creating new jobs, but at the same time, we must ensure that to have the success of these new jobs, then you must create also the right skill set. And, you, and for example, with the university, we have created new courses that cater. So you can have, for example, so master's in, in island studies at the University of Malta, which is a master's degree um, where students can learn the specificities, the vulnerabilities of um, small island states. And so this would help them when um, approaching uh, a new, let's say, job that requires green skills uh, specific for Malta, which is, of course, a, an island state and, and where um, there would be more demand, for example, for ocean, uh, ocean related, let's say, jobs than for forestry, for example, since we do not have forests. So 
one also has to see that the skills being offered are also relevant to the context. So it, it's useless trying to, to put forward um, uh, academic courses, let's say, for example, in deforestation, when we know that what Malta needs is more, um, for example, uh, um, sustainable development or uh, policy on, on, on ocean governance since we are an island state or, for example, uh, let's say um, sea level rise or, or temperature increases. So we, we try to also ensure that um, academia or universities, uh, institutes, etc. also target the sectors that are specific to, to Malta. But um, I think um, we have... Um, um, established uh, quite uh, quite a good reputation also in certain areas in in this regard. So we do have more um, let's say job opportunities uh, for uh, for people who wish to work on on environmental issues because of course uh, Malta also has its challenges. We have our vulnerabilities. For example, the issue of sea level rise is one thing that that we harp on a lot because it's very, very important for us. And um, the, the new industries that are created will have to be also within, within the context of our vulnerabilities. But to answer your question, yes, what we're trying to do is create new job opportunities within the public service, but ensure that the, um, the, the, the right people are also being employed uh, in these jobs. You talk about, uh, uh, of course, policies, and uh, and we have a long road uh, to to manage because we talk about uh, 2050, 2070. Uh, how the European guideline is helping you? Uh, you think that is going in the good direction? There is a common view by all the state of Europe. How is your um, your sensation about uh, the the approach of Europe? Well, I think the uh, the um, the fact that we are part of the European Union is very important because we are taking um, a, a holistic view of uh, of climate change, and um, the we are aware of of the issue of climate change and the challenges that we are facing. Uh, but on the other hand, it's important to note that we are always stressing that there is also the local context that has to be taken into account. So in that sense, um, the way I see it is, of course, there are European guidelines, but they are, um, let's say, drafted in consultation with member states. And um, we also have our views, our, um, our necessities, our, our peculiarities. So the most important is that uh, we keep in mind the principle of uh, common but differentiated. So we, um, of course, adhere to the guidelines, but um, there are issues where, for us, um, some, 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 let's say, guidelines might not um, be uh, applicable to us because of our uh, um, specificities. So I think it's important to note that although the EU works as, as a whole, um, it also takes into account um, the, um, the uh, let's say, the vulnerabilities or the challenges of, of states like Malta. So in that sense, if I can answer your question, um, what we're doing is we're tackling, um, let's say, climate change as an EU, as a whole, which, of course, makes more sense than trying to tackle it on your own, because climate change is also a team sport. Um, I mean, it is also uh, um, a, uh, a policy, let's say, or uh, an, an issue that uh, the more um, cooperation you have, the better you can achieve the goal. Uh, but uh, while it is a team sport, I think it's important to underline that um, we, our peculiarities and our specificities are also taken into account. And um, this was very evident, for example, when we had... Uh, negotiations also on um, on a new treaty at the United Nations on protecting natural resources that are beyond the national jurisdiction. So natural resources um, uh, on, uh, let's say, on the high seas, um, marine genetic resources in the high seas. 
And of course, this was a, a big call because more than 20 years have passed and there were no uh, success in negotiations until this year. Um, but you could see also that when we were discussing it uh, as an EU, um, member states, um, uh, let's say, divergences um, were taken into account. So even in the discussions, for example, of, of treaties, of, of directives, of, uh, let's say, uh, legislation, um, we are we are also um, we are also presented with the opportunity to to have our views, and that's always important because then you can um, negotiate um, better, considering your local context, your local circumstances. So it doesn't mean that because you have a treaty or because there are guidelines, etc., your position or your your outlook on how this should be implemented is not uh, present as well. So the point I'm trying to make is there is a holistic approach to combating climate change, but that doesn't mean that your national um, national views, your national, let's say, derogations uh, from, uh, from certain um, guidelines are not taken into account. And I think that's very, very important to, to underline. Thank you, Corinne, really. Uh, I would like to introduce and make a question to the other our guest, Mr. Filippo Verre, founder and scientific director of Abiaqua, that is uh, a think tank uh, leader on the hydro strategy. So we talked before about uh, uh, the different approach, no? and, and uh, Corinne say that uh, Malta, of course, is an island, so uh, priority for them, it could be more water than any other uh, environment uh, uh, actor. So uh, I would like to ask you, uh, according to your point of view, uh, which is the most important uh, uh, position, job position opportunity on, the, on this transition? And, uh, and which is the, in your opinion, uh, let's say policy and uh, and uh, action that should be done uh, in in this time in these years to to achieve the target that we have. Thank you uh, for this question and thank you for inviting me. This is uh, my second participation to uh, the forum Mediterranean Forum. It's always a big pleasure to to be uh, with you and to uh, talk about what uh, what is our job and what is what we do. Uh, thank you also for uh, Miss Corinne for her interesting insights. Um, to answer your question, I think um, climate change is a catalyst in the sense that um, there is a, a, there are many opportunities that can be taken in the years to come. What we do, um, as you um, as you said, I am the uh, founder and executive director of the first Italian think tank of water strategy. So our main approach is to study water as a strategic resource and how it can have a, a strong impact on uh, the economics, on the international relations, on the society of uh, basically all the countries that belong to the world. But just to remain uh, within the basin of the Mediterranean Sea, which is of course, the, the, our main geographic area. In the next 10, 15 years, uh, something between 50 and 70 million of uh, Mediterranean citizens will experience uh, water shortages. Uh, so it mean, this means that uh, when there is a, a lack of water, a water crisis, for example, everything is uh, uh, complicated in terms of uh, uh, water supply, of course, for personal and private needs, but also in terms of industrial uh, economic uh, productivity. Uh, this is because um, several uh, jobs, actually two thirds of the global uh, workforce is highly dependent on water. What does this mean? This means that if there is a water crisis, basically they, like the high majority of the uh, war jobs stop. It's impossible to, uh, from, day, from day to night, to have a, a work, uh, a productivity from any sort. Imagine, for example, a hotel, a restaurant, a hospital, a clinic uh, running without water. It's basically impossible. So directly to answer your question, uh, the, 
the main jobs that can be created in this uh, situation, in this, um, um, these days of climate change are for sure uh, environmental uh, scientists and uh, uh, experts, scientific expert, experts concerning uh, how to treat uh, and how to try to fix uh, uh, environmental issues linked with uh, climate change and uh, um, other important aspects concerning, of course, environmental issues. For what we um, for what uh, we are concerned, we think that water can have a very important impact in the next uh, years for the next generations. There are many things we can talk about, but um, what we do, for example, I am uh, and I'm saying uh, smiling, but uh, I really believe uh, in so. We, I am the product of the climate change in the sense that I am the uh, example of a new job that has been created uh, because uh, I am a water strategy expert. I uh, started working in this field in 2020, last month of 2020, so it's been uh, almost three years that I have been working for this organization, Abacqua, and uh, um, it's I am a living example of how climate change can impact uh, economics and the society of nations. We do many things concerning um, uh, how to address environmental issues and specifically water problems. For example, um, the, the previous speaker, uh, Ms. Corinne, um, talked about the importance of uh, um, implementing new academic courses, new uh, strategies at universities uh, to understand and how to to tackle uh, challenges. We, for example, we work with several universities uh, and we teach, I personally teach in uh, two universities um, in, in Italy, University of Florence, uh, specifically uh, a master in uh, water strategy, where water is considered a strategic resource for the security of a nation. And of course, the example is um, Italy. Italy is, is a country that doesn't have so many problems in water supply. But for example, in within the Mediterranean basin, we see that there are several problems linked with water supply. And I'm not talking uh, specifically to the Middle East and the MENA region, in which of course the arid lands are uh, of course, a, a big problem in terms of uh, uh, water supply. Malta for sure also is a, uh, an island that is pretty arid and there is a an important issue linked with um, uh, water supply. But for example, let's consider Spain. Spain is an important country and even a, a big country from a geographical standpoint. It, the extension of, of Spain is pretty, is pretty relevant. The southern part of Spain is uh, a very arid land. In fact, how the, the Spanish government is trying to fix this um, uh, situation, well, within um, an approach that uh, is um, is pretty smart in terms of um, uh, providing a certain stock of water, no matter if uh, it rains or not. In fact, Spain is the fourth country in the world in terms of uh, desalination. It's the first country in Europe that uh, has a high um, percentage of desalinated water. Uh, the force in the world, for example, is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a, a country that produces an incredible amount of uh, desalinated water. Um, but Spain is going towards this direction to try to fix uh, many problems, not only in the southern part of the country, but also I'm referring to, for example, the Canary Island or um, uh, where, of course, the, the water supply is uh, very complicated, but also the uh, Baleari uh, islands in uh, within the Mediterranean basin. So um, many jobs can be created. And as I was saying, I'm an example of that. My activity is mostly theoretical uh, in terms of uh, uh, doing research and uh, providing a solution also to governments, but also we are work as a consultant. I am a water consultant and in the next uh, weeks, I will go to Turkey, for example, I'm telling you uh, this um, to show that we work uh, as a, um, to try to solve many problems. Um, another important aspect uh, that can be linked with um, uh, climate change and the creation of the new jobs is to try to uh, use artificial intelligence and inno innovative technologies to solve these problems. 
Why am I saying that? Because we are in cooperation with several companies and we try to provide um, a better service, for example, to the water supply. I was uh, referring about Turkey because we are going to, um, to, to do a project with an important Turkish city of 2 million people that uh, needs to have a better water supply for its aqueduct. The aqueduct was built uh, around 10, 15 years ago. They need now um, artificial intelligence to understand, for example, if there is a water leaking, if there is, a, for example, a theft of water. Um, so in this case, we are providing uh, European technology to fix a problem that is in Turkey. And it is very interesting to understand how water can be also a, a way to connect communities and to connect uh, peoples, governments, agencies, institutions that uh, can work together and create jobs, uh, doing projects and um, trying to um, easing uh, life for many people. So personally, I think climate change is something is going to change our life for the worst mostly, but we need to be ready to uh, catch the opportunities to make everything out of it that could be for example working in projects and understanding what we do and in abacqua we are doing it and this is just one example i can make many other examples but i'm sure uh, matteo will uh, you know ask me some other uh, things so maybe we can talk later yeah, but... i have i have a question for you because you talk about uh, uh, of course a, a nice overview um but let's say that uh, uh, you enter in many, many topics, no? Uh, and one topic that I would like to ask you, it's uh, uh, how Europe, in your opinion, is ready and Mediterranean country are ready uh, with infrastructures? Because Italy, you say, have no problem, let's say, to have water because we have many sources of water, but our infrastructure should be rebuilt, restored or adapted to the new needs. So uh, this is, in your opinion, the next step of the uh, investments that should be done? Absolutely. Uh, when we talk about um, infrastructures, uh, especially for water supply, um, the, the situation is pretty complicated in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but what Europe uh, uh, excels is uh, innovation technology and um, um, means to, of course, invest and provide uh, uh, new opportunities. So uh, in my opinion, what we could do as Europeans is, first of all, to invest in our infrastructures. We, are, for example, with my organization, we uh, work um, with um, several aqueducts. And uh, in Italy, the problem is that uh, almost 50% of the water uh, doesn't reach the private houses because there are many leakings. Um, but uh, that is why uh, not only we have to uh, invest money to resolve uh, to try to resolve the problem but also we have to try to understand if there are new paradigms new strategies that can be implemented and we as abacqua we are going to um, like consult and uh, recommend the use of artificial intelligence and innovation technology technology in fact we will deliver a, a speech at cop 28 we've been invited to talk, to talk about how technology can have an impact in uh, preventing uh, challenges uh, and trying to solve challenges uh, from climate change and uh, uh, we have several examples but the infrastructures of course need to be um, um, like rebuilt and a lot of money should be invested in in this but there are also other ways in which um, climate change can be uh, addressed for example we are uh, working with a, a company that uh, produces water from the humidity of the air so this company creates, uh, um, there are different products, but they can create uh, up to like 2000 liters per day of clean water from the air. This is incredible because uh, this can be actually a game changer, especially for countries that uh, have uh, uh, like hard times in collecting the money and also providing the technology to, to I don't know, to drill, to, uh, to, to build a well, or to have a modern infrastructure. So um, it's interesting to understand what can be done with uh, little, because Europe in one way or another will is going to make it because there is uh, uh, investments are there, uh, the technology is there, uh, there is the 
public and political will to make it better. But as a Mediterranean basin, what are we going to do to make others uh, to feel uh, comfortable in dealing with environmental challenges for the future? And uh, the main region, the Middle East region, is uh, going to have many, many problems. So another thing that we've been working on uh, is, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, water as a mean of communication and as cooperation. We uh, we know what's going on nowadays, unfortunately, in Israel, no? with the, the crisis between uh, uh, in the Middle East, the war in, uh, in Gaza, etc. It's interesting, in my opinion, to understand how water can be considered as a tool to foster cooperation, regional cooperation. For example, uh, Israel and Jordan are countries that have very good relationship. Why? Mostly because of a, a environmental cooperation. For example, Israel, like Europe, is a very technologically advanced country. Imagine that Israel produces 25% of water, more of the water that it actually needs. This water is used by Israel to create opportunities, diplomatic ties, to foster bonds between uh, neighboring countries. And Jordan, which is a country that needs water because it's pretty arid, it's a pretty arid land, and needs of course, the water and benefits from uh, the water that is um, delivered by Israel through, as Matteo was recommending, the investment in uh, infrastructure, water infrastructure. So in order to solve environmental problems, uh, cooperation should be the first uh, approach that countries should adopt, even more than uh, working with projects or trying to invest money because it's climate change environmental problems, water scarcity, for example, uh, are all problems that affect everyone. Some countries uh, in, in a very aggressive way, others less. But we should cooperate in order to fix many problems that we are going to face and we are already facing nowadays. And I think for the, we've been working, for example, as a backer with the Israeli embassy in, uh, in Italy, exactly, to understand how technology can uh, apply to water can be used to foster cooperation and as the example with Israel and Jordan this works so it's uh, in our little experience with uh, the this Turkey city I will visit in the next couple of weeks we are we see that this thing is already working we have an Italian company that is working with a, a important uh, Turkish municipality to to work together to deliver a project so so Climate change can be something that unifies um, communities, institutions, and nations also. According, according to your experience, uh, which is the suggestion that you can uh, supply to the, to the city mayor and to the, to the city to face uh, the climate change and the hydro strategy? Uh, I talk about Italy, but you can say about all the Mediterranean country. You said that you are uh, now developing this project in Turkey. You develop many projects around yeah. the world, as I know. So, uh, which is the first approach that uh, the the city the city mayor should be uh, put in order to to start this process? Thank you for this question, which is a very important question. And you uh, asking this question, you pointed out the the, the biggest problem, and uh, it it when it comes with um, managing uh, uh, water crisis but an environmental crisis in general we've been uh, analyzing two important water crises in the past uh, i'm talking about cape town 2018 chennai in india 2019 in both these situations the environmental crisis water caused by water scarcity was so uh, great that the production, uh, local production, um, the municipality, the, the services were down for many weeks, in some cases even months. In both these cases, what was the biggest thing that lacked was uh, cooperation, interinstitutional cooperation. For example, in the Cape Town crisis, um, there was a political conflict between the party that was ruling the city which was uh, like of a certain political uh, orientation and the party that was ruling the state and the uh, the region the province because um of course 
they provided different solutions, they wanted to achieve uh, different results. So th the problem was uh, this approach, this dichotomy, institutional dichotomy, created even more problems than the environmental crisis itself. So this example of Cape Town and um, to a minor extent also of Chennai in India 2019 gave us as Abakwa the uh, idea of uh, instead of uh, focusing on the solution, the technical solution, it is important to understand the teleological solution. So the, what is the goal that we want to achieve in order to fix this problem? Uh, what is the approach, the common, common approach that we want to have? Because uh, climate change is going to um, challenge uh, regions, cities, nations. The opportunity, uh, the, not the opportunity, the, the problems that we are going to face are very important. And we need to approach with uh, unity towards uh, the resolution of the crisis. Often, in, uh, if we look back in modern history, because these two crises I mentioned happened 2018, 2019. So in terms of uh, uh, modern history, it's like it happened yesterday. Uh, we notice that in, in times of uh, emergency, uh, political institutions often don't work together. And this is a problem because this also exacerbates the crisis, uh, causing even more problems to private individuals, companies, industries, and the economy uh, um, at the end of the day. So um, I would focus mainly, especially in the first days of the crisis and of the problem, to finding a common solution, to find a, like a strategy that is um, accepted by all the parties involved, and then focusing on the investment and the uh, technical approach, because these two are uh, two important steps that need to go together in order to actually find a solution that is going to last and uh, that is going to have uh, positive effects for everyone. Thank you, Filippo. The last question. Uh, you talk about uh, a master in hydro strategy that yeah. you are developing and that you have uh, you have ready, let's say. Yeah. So you, you just started this master in some university or uh, not yet? We actually, this is the second year we've been uh, um, proposing this master, uh, in particular with uh, the University of Florence, in which I teach uh, like in the Master of uh, Intelligence and National Security. My, I uh, work with, uh, like I teach uh, um, lessons concerning water uh, strategy and how water is considered uh, a diplomatic uh, tool to increase the presence of a country in another area, for example, uh, or uh, how is it is used as a mean to uh, geopolitical power. I, so, University of Florence, we collaborate in Italy with the University of Lumsa in Rome uh, with similar subjects. And I've, be, I've recently been invited to deliver a conference at uh, Lewis University in that specific uh, uh, conference I talked about water um, as a tool that China uses to uh, uh, implement its presence in uh, many areas in the world. In fact, the conference was uh, titled the Water Diplomacy, and I talked about the case study of China. It was a, a good conference. Uh, it attracted a lot of uh, interest. The uh, students were very excited. I have to say, I, I, I was very happy with the result um, because I I think that this is an interesting subject uh, besides being uh, important as for all the reasons that we described. So we've been working uh, with several universities now for uh, a couple of years. I personally uh, created uh, this water uh, course, this water strategy uh, university course that is about 15, 20 lessons, but can be adapted to the need of the university and the need of the institution in which I provide a, the first part is a theoretical uh, course uh, in which we understand the role of uh, water from an environmental standpoint an industrial standpoint, economic and also diplomatic. And then the second part is uh, practical, empirical. There are six, seven empirical case, cases in which I analyze, for example, the case, uh, the, the water crisis in Chennai, water diplomacy of China, the importance of Tibet, 
uh, for uh, uh, Chinese, but also Indian uh, foreign policies, the uh, like uh, Turkish foreign approach for water colonialism in certain areas. So, uh, I have to say we've been working uh, with uh, interesting results uh, on this water course that is uh, accepted and is uh, uh, appreciated by professors and students. So um, thank you for this question. And uh, we would like, of course, to work uh, even more uh, to deliver in more universities because water will be an important subject to study and to talk about. I think a water strategy is maturing, uh, pressed by uh, actual and current affairs, environmental crisis and uh, political uh, uh, crisis. So um, we, we've been working and we're very happy uh, with this course. So uh, we are uh, near to the conclusion. Uh, I'm sorry because I would like to listen to you both uh, uh, for all day, but you, of course, have many, many uh, appointments and, uh, and you are very busy. So I thank you for your time here. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, to ask to both of you, uh, so we can we can say that uh, there will be many 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 opportunities, and we can say that uh, in the future uh, it will be maybe a space for green manager uh, in private and public sector, uh, and it will be the the, the priority for uh, for uh, all of us. Uh, but I have I have a, a question that uh, not very easy, but I want your opinion. Uh, is changing also the way of uh, management of the commodities. And uh, we are exploring commodities as well in Europe, okay? Uh, so how this uh, action uh, can face with the climate change, in your opinion? Finito, Who's gonna ask? Can, uh, ah, it's, can, I can... Uh, yeah, yeah can I think, you. yeah, uh, basically, um, Everything changed um, concerning us. Um, everything changed since 2020 because since 2020, water has been uh, listed for the first time uh, at NASDAQ. Uh, so it became a, a commodity. So this changed basically everything under many circumstances. And then uh, we are talking about a, an element that is a, a, necessary for human life that is being treated like a commodity like like gold diamonds uh, um, so this of course uh, is uh, th there is there is a pre and after uh, this situation so what is going to happen now is to understand what um, is the uh, what is the conclusion of this process because uh, when a commodity is listed on Nasdaq on a financial market, this means that can be um, that can be investment that can uh, provoke shortages, can provoke uh, you know many crises of this uh, element. Uh, for example, in uh, different parts of the world. So I understand and I agree with you. Uh, we will need for the foreseeable future uh, green managers, but also financial experts that are. Um, working and are studying uh, this market because when we have for example a, a shortages of oil of gold or diamonds or whatever another important commodity we can have an economic problem we can have a, a industrial uh, you know slowdown industrial uh, economic even um, downturn but when we have a lack of water a shortage of, of water we will have uh, many problems in uh, dealing with uh, how our everyday life from day to night so it's um it's really something that is going to affect us very much and i think uh, that green managers will uh, can be a solution uh, also because it's important to understand how we can prevent this uh, from happening but i also think that um, other than green manager uh, water strategies uh, experts um, uh, environmental scientists etc what we need is to uh, be able to um, spread uh, the importance of environmental issues in also an innovative way to young generations because if we think about what we always uh, what is the approach the traditional approach 
to young generations to scare to scare them to like oh we're gonna have a, our future is in danger we're gonna have many problems we're gonna have uh, we don't know if like in 10 days we will have in, in the necessary to go on this for sure is an approach i don't think in, in at the end of the day this will pay dividends what could be done on the other hand is to understand that we have a problem but we also have to understand how we can uh, fix this trying to create opportunities so like uh, talk about the new jobs that can be uh, found in the green market in the water market and try to uh, talk about climate change not as a a, a, a problem that is going to eventually kill us but as a challenge that we need to uh, win and that after that we will have a better world because there are jobs there are opportunities and there is a spread uh, wealth uh, between uh, old and new players i'm talking about states organization and also institutions colin we can uh, we can say that uh, so climate change is a real opportunity yes i was i was going to uh, to add on to what uh, to what my, uh, yeah. my fellow panelists said as well and i agree with him uh, completely on the the need to not only have uh, green uh, managers but also finance managers and in this sense um, i wanted to um, outline that there are already um, uh, many top universities that uh, are um, gearing towards this this new let's say uh, this, this new job opportunities in in uh, in finance uh, i'm not aware that there are any in malta at the moment but i know that there are some very very interesting um courses and degrees etc at, um, at top universities especially in the united kingdom that deal specifically with um climate finance climate financing and uh, also the the need for uh, even civil servants so it's not just for financiers or bankers but also for civil servants to understand the the relationship between uh, climate and financing, but also uh, the the use of, uh, as you rightly pointed out, um, uh, the use of them as commodities. So there is also uh, there are also specific courses that are dealing with uh, with this new, let's say, uh, let's say trend. And uh, the idea is to to have them understand how how climate change relates to to finance and investment opportunities. So. This is something that I think is very important. I think also for many civil servants. Um, from my side, um, I can say that uh, Malta is very, very much um, also cooperating with, with other partners, especially in the United Kingdom and within the Commonwealth um, to, uh, to finance climate. And we have um, financed many, many climate um, uh, climate uh, projects, etc. So this is also another um, sort of, there are also other job opportunities that are being created that are not strictly, um, let's say, technical, environmental, um, water, sustainable development, but specifically the relationship between um, the climate change, uh, impact of climate change and finance. So. I think it's a very exciting, uh, very exciting opportunity, and I think these kind of jobs will really be um, will really be the future. I think I can see uh, a lot of uh, of opportunities, a lot of opportunities there, not only within international organisations uh, per se, but also um, within private businesses and uh, let's say banks and and, uh, and financial institutions. So yes, in that in that sense, there's also a different discipline that has been um, that has been uh, created, and that's that's the relationship between um, climate change and uh, and uh, finance and and commodities. And I, I think um, that uh, I would love to see more of these courses uh, in my country. I haven't come across any of them because, of course, you really need. Uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of investment as well, and, and usually these are top universities that that are specifically focusing 
on uh, on uh, on these disciplines that are able to um, to carry out uh, the, these courses but I hope that this will also uh, make its way here and in other countries. Uh, so far, I see a lot of this in the UK and the, in, the, in the United States. Uh, I'm not aware of many European countries offering uh, these these type of uh, um, of courses. Uh, but of course, I may be um, I might I, I stand to be corrected. But I know that there is a lot of uh, a lot of new opportunities being generated um, with uh, with uh, businesses, banks, etc. in the UK and the US. So again, that's another um, opportunity that I think is is really exciting. Um, I, I would be excited to even um, um, go into it as 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 a discipline as a civil servant, of course. But yes, I agree totally with with my fellow panelists that. Um, uh, there can be these these jobs as well that uh, will, uh, let's say, uh, dictate the future of of the job market. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I have to say thanks to both of you. Unfortunately, the time is finished. So uh, really, thanks to Miss Corinne Kasha, thanks to Filippo Verre. Welcome back, maybe yes. in, the, in the next months in another panel and we can go ahead and, uh, and update uh, this very, very, very nice discussion because we touch many, 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 many topics that uh, uh, should, should be uh, going deeply on. So yes. thank you and very now much. More, now more than ever, because of course we have COP28 coming up. So <laughs> that's also might have some more interesting updates after that. I think so. I think so. Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome to the Mediterranean uh, Forum whenever you want.